Thank you and welcome everyone. Uh, this virtual meeting remains uh, in compliance with the Bagley Keene Open Meetings Act. As such, there will be the ability for public comment on all agenda items at the end of the meeting. If you wish to provide a comment, please indicate so by submitting your request in the Q&A field and we will unmute you to comment publicly in the order comments are received. Comments will be held to strict three minutes per person. Thank you. Lieutenant Governor, Madam Chair, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Emily. I hereby call this meeting of the International Affairs and Trade Development uh, Committee to order. Uh, this committee has been established by Governor Newsom pursuant to Executive Order N0819. The purpose of today's meeting is to review and inform the public about recent activities undertaken by our state agencies and departments with international partners and to hear public comments that can help us guide and prioritize our future international uh, engagements. Um, Madam Secretary, would you please call the roll? Yes, thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Um, Director Dee Dee Myers. Here. Secretary Hopeschild. Secretary Ross. Present. Secretary Crowfoot. Director Gillarducci. Helen Lopez for Director Gillarducci. Thank you, Helen. Secretary Blumenfeld. Present. Secretary Kim. Here. CEO Carolyn Batetta. Here. Chair Randolph. I'm here. And Samuel Asefa. Thank you, everyone. Lieutenant Governor, a quorum has been established. Thank you very much, Ms. Desai. Our first order of business is uh, approval of the minutes from the June 2021 Interagency Committee meeting. May I have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. We have a motion from Secretary Myers and a second from Ms. Batetta. Motion carries. Uh, and next, I'd like to just offer a few opening remarks of this uh, quarterly meeting of the Interagency uh, Committee for International Affairs and Trade Development. The goal of this committee is to bring together all the state's agencies, departments, and programs that are engaged in international activity in order to assure cohesiveness to our international strategy and to give the public an opportunity to learn what we are doing and to provide feedback and input. In today's meeting, we will give an update on our activities since last June, share an overview of California's participation at COP26, and provide a snapshot of what our international affairs and trade priorities will be in the new calendar year. Meetings like this one and the exchange of information and shared best practices are of tremendous importance. And one of the many things we've learned during this pandemic is that our international relationships are more important now than ever as we look to support economic recovery and resilience. I'd like to take a moment to highlight some activities we have engaged in with our top trade partners and underscore a number of initiatives we've undertaken in recent months. In particular, I'd like to give a quick update on our work with Mexico and Japan, and I'll touch briefly on California's participation in COP26. Throughout and in spite of the pandemic, Mexico has remained the number one destination for California exports and our number two overall trading partner. Our two-way trade in 2020 amounted to nearly $72 billion. This trade is reciprocal and interdependent. While California exported $24 billion in products to Mexico, we imported Mexican products valued at nearly $48 billion. We continue to advance key border infrastructure projects to ensure that trade continues and promotes cross-border economic development, including the Otay Mesa East Port of Entry. In June, I was pleased to join Secretary Kim to, join, to participate in the signing of the MOU between California and Mexico 
on the Otai Mesa East project. And last month I participated in a virtual briefing on the project with a newly appointed US ambassador to Mexico, Ambassador Ken Salazar. I've appreciated the strong communication from and collaboration with the San Diego Association of Governments and Caltrans so that those of us in state government can stay apprised of and advocating for SANDAG's priority projects, including Otay Mesa East Port of Entry, as well as their regional plan, the Central Mobility Hub, and the Del Mar Bluffs Los San realignment. In November, I had the opportunity to travel to Washington, D.C., where I met with Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg, about the Otay Mesa East project and had the opportunity to underscore the importance of this new border crossing to the regional economy and to our relations with Mexico. Our revitalized Commission of the Californias provides an excellent platform for continued exchange on additional priority activities <clears throat> as we all continue to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. Both the governor and I are committed to continuing our commitment to advancing cross-border economic development, and we are eager to develop meaningful and mutually beneficial relationships with the new governors who have recently assumed office in Baja California and Baja California Sur. And just yesterday, I participated in a meeting of the California-Mexico Border Relations Council, chaired by Secretary Jer Jared Blumenfeld, which was attended by Baja California Governor Marina del Pilar Avila Omeda. I'd also like to make a few comments about Japan, a special focus for us this year. California is the number one state in the US in terms of exports to Japan, accounting for nearly 17% of total US exports. And we import more goods from Japan than any other state in the nation. Total trade between California and Japan amounted to over $30 billion in 2020. Perhaps more important even is that Japan is our number one source of foreign direct investment. Last year, just over 3,600 Japanese companies operating in California created 115,420 jobs and accounted for $10.6 billion in wages. We are pleased to be in the process of renewing our memorandum of cooperation with the government of Japan. And we are proud to host two Japanese consulates general in our Colson state, as well as two Japanese Japan external trade organization offices, which we work closely with on a regular basis. We've been working very hard these past few months to deepen our partnership with Japan with a potential trade delegation in March. I recognize the challenges posed by the new travel restrictions. I know that it is not the direction any of us hope to see and that it may prevent our ability to do a trip this March. But I want to make it very clear to everyone here today, just because we may need to postpone the March travel date a few months to later in the year, it does not in any way lessen our full and complete commitment to expanding the depth and breadth of our trade and investment relationship. Collaboration with the consulates, JETRO, the Japan Chamber of Commerce of Northern California the Japan Business Association of Southern California, and the many businesses from Japan that have invested so significantly in our state will continue to be critical in that effort. We are very grateful for their support, partnership, and friendship. Finally, I'd like to share a few comments about COP26, the United Nations Climate Summit held in, held in Glasgow, Scotland last November. I was very honored to lead the impressive delegation of senior officials from the Newsom administration, including many members of his cabinet, as well as 15 members of the California State Legislature. I helped kick off, I helped to kick off California's participation with panel discussions featuring US Presidential Envoy for Climate, John Kerry, White House National Climate Advisor, Gina McCarthy, and the governors of New Mexico and Louisiana. 
At every event, the representatives from the Biden administration sent a clear message. America is all in and back at the table with the rest of the world. My message from California was that the world needs to focus on scaling up climate solutions. And California is ready to use its subnational leadership and the power of our innovation economy to help. I was so heartened to see the strong commitment from the Biden administration and all the countries and subnational governments that entered into a series of multilateral agreements on issues including zero emission vehicles, forest protection, and methane reduction. The side agreements on transportation were some of the most aggressive commitments to date from countries and subnational governments to curb the use of fossil fuels and slash greenhouse gas emissions. While I was in Glasgow, I also had the opportunity to sign on behalf of the governor and the state of California, the Edinburgh Declaration on Biodiversity, which recognizes the role for subnational governments in the protection of the world's biodiversity. California is the first US state to sign on, marking the latest example of our critical leadership on environmental issues. I'm looking forward to hearing the takeaways from members of our committee here who also joined us in Glasgow and served as such effective representatives on our state, of our state on the global stage. But first, I'd like to pass it over to our vice chair, director of GoBiz, Dee Dee Myers. Again, thank you everyone for being here, for our participants, our panelists, and uh, it's exciting to be back virtually for this meeting. Secretary Myers, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Lieutenant Governor. I really appreciate uh, your comments and thank you everybody. Hi, uh, I'm gonna spend a little time updating uh, on um, GoBiz's international engagement in our work, but a lot of that in recent months has focused on the supply chain uh, and the obvious uh, congestion issues that we're facing. So, um, uh, and then I'll talk more broadly about Go Business International work. But as, as you all know, in recent months, uh, much has been said and written about causes of the current supply chain congestion. It's a global problem years in the making. Uh, changing cost structures, new technologies, evolving tariffs are among the things that were already putting pressure on the system. And when COVID-19 hit, the challenges were, were greatly exacerbated. So as the problems mounted, we knew uh, that it was critical to bring together the div diverse network of supply chain stakeholders to discuss some of the key challenges and creative solutions. The, you know, the state of California uh, doesn't regulate much of the supply chain. It is an independent system of systems, but it has a phenomenal impact on our economy. And there are things that we can do and are responsible for. So. Uh, in September, we partnered with, um, with Cal State, Secretary Kim is with us, the Port of Long Beach and Cal State Long Beach to bring again, to bring together the stakeholders and begin this conversation, which we call the California Supply Chain Su Success Initiative. Uh, there will be a final report from that gathering later this month, it will be public, uh, but the convening made clear that the stakeholders across this uh, system of system systems agreed on both some short and some longer term steps that we could take to get things moving again, including temporary storage space for containers uh, and collecting, sharing, and using data more efficiently and effectively going forward. Uh, perhaps the most important takeaway was that there's broad agreement that in order to make any progress, every stakeholder is gonna have to step up and make hard choices and become part of the solution, including the state of California. And, I'm pleased to say that every day, uh, everybody continues to, to work towards that. Uh, on our end, the governor, uh, uh, I think the conversation we had accelerated our work and led to the governor signing executive order N1921, which came out on September 20th. Uh, and in response to that EO, we've taken a number of steps, including creating an interagency supply chain task force, which most of the members here are also on, to implement the goals of the executive order and identify other potential solutions, um, including working with public and private partners to identify additional land um, for short-term storage container storage, uh, uh, container storage, and also um, just working more broadly across the, the spectrum. Uh, we're also continuing to work with our partners in the federal government, including Port Envoy 
John Procari and the Biden Harris Supply Chain Disruption Task Force. And I can tell you they have been in incredibly engaged and very, very helpful, uh, including last month, the governor and the US Department of Transportation announced a strategic partnership that will help facilitate innovative projects and financing opportunities for multi billion dollar infrastructure improvements in California, the kind of long term investments uh, that will really make sure our supply chain is more resilient uh, and more uh, future proof. Uh, and that includes up to $5 billion in additional funding for our ports and supply chain infrastructure. So we're very uh, much looking forward to implementing that. Um, with the signing of the federal bipartisan infrastructure bill last month, there is also an additional opportunity for funding from that source to support our supply chain infrastructure. Uh, we'll all need to work together to maximize those opportunities and make sure that that funding uh, is, is invested in transformational projects that will, again, uh, help maximize our efficiency and resilience going forward. Um, you know, it's clear that there's no single cause to this current situation and there's no single solution. So we're gonna to need to continue to work together on uh, a range of solutions, including, as mentioned, um, identifying sites to store and, and transition cargo, transitioning the entire supply chain towards something more like 24 seven. Um, and you can't transition one node of the supply chain unless you transition all nodes. So that's very much a work in progress. And we're working with the ports to clear those empty containers off the ports and allow ships to be unloaded more quickly. And to, again, put some of the velocity back into the whole system. So um, it will continue to take a, a major investment and, 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 and engagement by all the supply chain stakeholders. And I'm very encouraged by how the ports and the retailers and the railroads and the warehouses and the workforce have all stepped up to address these complex and interconnected challenges. And we've seen a substantial drop in uh, import containers sitting on docks in the last few weeks as we've you know, continued to work together. And I wanna give one quick shout out to the workforce here. Uh, you know, I think it's important to note that in spite of the congestion, in spite of the challenges, the, Euro, the, 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 the uh, ports in Los Angeles and Southern California are producing, are, are processing almost 20% more goods than they did in their peak year 2018, which is really, I think, a sign of the Herculean effort um, that workers across the supply chain have put in. Um, so moving on um, to our foreign direct investment work, we know that all businesses, including those foreign owned, choose to start and expand in California in part because of our world-class logistics infrastructure and our access uh, to global ports. And our state's exporters depend on that infrastructure to ship their products around the world. Uh, and so uh, with regard to foreign direct investment, we've been busy actively showcasing California as a top tier business destination and connecting directly with hundreds of companies around the world to consult with them on their next steps in considering expansion in our state. So for example, in July, we worked with the US Embassy in Singapore and the US Foreign Commercial Service to showcase business opportunities in the Golden State. 180 companies participated in that webinar, uh, representing firms from across Southeast Asia, including Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, and Myanmar. And of those, 100, register 100 of the registrants followed up for one-on-one -on -one meetings with GoBiz International, so we're gratified by that. Um, ensuring we stay connected with the US Foreign Commercial Service to be introduced to investors is critical uh, and it makes an impact. For example, Delfast Bikes is an electric bike company from Ukraine that makes e-bikes for applications in law enforcement. And the company recently established operations in Whittier, California, where they signed a six-year lease for an office and storefront. And they were introduced to GoBiz through the US, US Commercial Service in Ukraine and are now hiring California workers. So we're pleased about that. A final point on the FDI side, I just want to highlight a website that we created highlighting foreign direct investment success stories and testimonials. Those stories are based on information provided by the participating international or internationally affiliated companies that have invested in California. And it's about why these companies have chosen California to launch and grow their businesses. So we're, so we're proud of that uh, and encourage you to take a look. Um, with regard to export development, um, with more hybrid models continuing, we know that small businesses may find it easier than ever to enter the global marketplace and grow their company's sales. Uh, and we'll be right by their side, virtually or otherwise, supporting them along the way. Uh, we continued our cost-effective and high-impact model of virtual trade missions. In September, we launched our 10th virtual event focused on a healthcare mission to the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, and to Saudi Arabia. 17 companies in California's life sciences 
pharmaceutical and medical device sectors travel virtually with us to the Middle East to showcase their best in class products and services in these expanding markets. So uh, great news there. As we look ahead, we'll continue to support California companies uh, to exhibit at the Japan Smart Energy Week in Tokyo, a fantastic example of the way the state's advancing the clean tech sector. And we're actively planning a virtual trade mission to India um, that will take place in March. So finally, these are just a few of the highlights that's uh, to what's been a very busy year. GoBiz International will continue to focus on programs and services that align with the future competitiveness of California and California's businesses within that global economy. We'll continue to expand our capacity to facilitate connections, build capabilities, and share risk with California firms that export. Uh, with investment attraction, we'll continue to fully align business expansion and recruitment activity with international trade efforts, advocate for critical investments in logistics infrastructure, and finally, work directly with local leaders to engage our federal partners strategically and systematically to raise awareness of trade issues. So I'm looking forward to staying in touch with this group regarding all the great work that's happening on the international front and where our collective efforts can further enhance uh, our success and collaboration. So thank you all. And thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Thank you very much, Secretary Myers. And let me, let me just underscore um, how hard the trade officers over at GoBiz have been working. And three years ago, when the governor and I sat down to ask that question, what could we do to be able to truly expand opportunities for California businesses and exports and expand the ability of companies um, uh, around the world to invest here? Uh, and we went through various options. Uh, it was, uh, to me, the most obvious thing to do to expand the team at GoBiz in order to be able to do this work. And so Secretary Myers, when you talk about that long list of engagements, especially now that so much of it can be done virtually, it's very, very gratifying because people have been saying for a long time how much more we can and should be doing at the state level and you and your team are doing it. So it's fantastic. Well, thank you. And yes, on behalf of the GoBiz team, thank you for your leadership as well. So thank you, appreciate it. Okay, so now we are going to um, do as we uh, traditionally do during these meetings is turn to um, all of the uh, secretaries and department heads for their roughly seven minute each reports. Uh, and we've divided it up a little bit. So we're going to have three uh, reports from Secretary Kim, Director Gilarducci and Carolyn Batetta from Visit California. And then we're going to turn to uh, the rest of the panelists um, to talk specifically um, about uh, uh, not just to hear their reports, but also specifically to hear <clears throat> impressions from those who also traveled to Glasgow, since we're having sort of a special focus uh, this at this meeting on uh, COP26. Uh, so with that, we will turn it to you, Secretary uh, of California State Transportation uh, Agency, Secretary Kim, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, Lieutenant Governor. It's great to see you and all members of the committee. I'm so glad you mentioned at the outset in your report, Lieutenant Governor, the Otay Mesa East Port of Entry Project, a major priority for the state of California. And when it is complete in 2024, it will play a huge role in facilitating international trade between California and Mexico and make sure that we can maintain that that standing in terms of Mexico being a uh, major trading partner. So it's very exciting. Um, in terms of funding, much of the project has been funded, uh, several hundred million uh, from the state of California, but we still need uh, more funding and financing. And so the Sandag and Caltrans team are pursuing innovative financing through the US Department of Transportation's TIFIA program. And so they recently submitted a letter of intent to DOT to enter into uh, the TIFIA credit program. So we should know more about that in the coming weeks and months. Um, also want to mention that just a few weeks ago, the Biden-Harris administration announced its action plan for America's ports and waterways. And under that plan, key ports of entry will be prioritized for funding purposes. And these ports will, will receive assistance for modernization and expansion. And so. Uh, last week, I sent a letter to Secretary Buttigieg requesting that Otay Mesa East be included on that priority list. 
And then the other big issue on Otay Mesa is the need for federal staffing to handle throughput of people and goods. We did an analysis and based on that uh, numbers crunching, 265 new CBP officers will be required to staff Otay Mesa East when it opens in a few years. And so I've written to both the Department of Homeland Security and Office of Management and Budget to request that the administration include funding in the president's fiscal year 2023 budget to begin staffing Otay Mesa East. So much more to come and uh, it's a very exciting project and it's going to um, be a game changer in terms of uh, facilitating the flow of both people and goods between California and Mexico. Uh, real quickly on supply chain issues, Didi did a great job of covering um, much of what has happened in recent months. Um, I should mention that Didi and I both testified before the Assembly and Senate Select Committees on Ports and Goods Movement. That hearing took place in early November. Very thorough hearing, a lot of questions, a lot of comments by members of uh, both the Assembly and Select Committees. Uh, a lot of stakeholders also uh, testified at that hearing. Also, um, and I think we may hear more about this from Secretary Ross, several of us, uh, Didi, Karen and I were involved in a meeting uh, that just ended uh, a few moments ago. Uh, this was a meeting with the ag industry, especially exporters, uh, to hear from them and brainstorm different ideas on what we can be doing collectively in the short term and long term to improve overall velocity and throughput of agricultural products. Uh, so that was a really good meeting. And I think uh, from that meeting, we will be able to uh, move forward on a series of different uh, steps, both long term and short term. Didi mentioned the governor's executive order on supply chain challenges. Uh, on the transportation side, Caltrans has been issuing overweight trucking permits uh, for international containers, and they will be doing this through the end of June. This will enable heavier trucks, up to 88,000 pounds, to move through the state highway system, as well as interstates between ports and distribution centers. And then on the DMV side, uh, they have taken a series of actions to nearly double commercial driver's license testing capacity, which is really important given the uh, truck driver shortage. And as Didi mentioned, there are signs of progress being made on the ground. Uh, ports of LA and Long Beach are seeing a pretty sizable decrease in long dwelling containers. And so the docks are becoming less cluttered and this should hopefully enable LA and Long Beach to increase velocity and fluidity. Also, um, Didi mentioned it, um, we entered into a strategic partnership with the US Department of Transportation. The, the, the great thing about this partnership is that through something called the Emerging Projects Agreement, we will be advancing a portfolio of freight, goods movement and supply chain related projects in a holistic manner. And these are projects that could be, uh, that could qualify for TIFI and RIF. These are innovative finance programs at US DOT. Because quite frankly, the way it was done in the past was a series of one-off projects without any relation to one another. This is being done in a holistic, comprehensive way. And that's what's beautiful about this agreement. It's a complete 180 from the way we've done it in the past. And this will enable us to really advance and move forward on a series of uh, freight projects that will uh, help the situation. Finally, uh, just a few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to meet with Netherlands Vice Minister of Infrastructure and Water Management, Roald LaPere. And I believe he also met with the Lieutenant Governor along with Wade, Jared, and other members of this committee. We had a um, terrific conversation about the global MOU on zero emission freight that was signed last month at COP26. Uh, we also talked about the Transport Decarbonization Alliance that's now being led by CARB. Uh, we also spent a lot of time talking about active transportation and the link to land use and how that has the great potential to reconnect communities and also the need to encourage greater mode shift to address the transportation demand side of the equation. We all know zero emission vehicles are central to our overall strategy. And at the same time, we also need to really push hard on encouraging greater mode shift, active transportation, walking, biking, transit rail, micro mobility options, all of those things work together to reduce our overall carbon footprint. So it was an excellent conversation uh, with the vice minister. Uh, and with that, that concludes my report. Thank you for the time, Lieutenant Governor, and I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you very much, Secretary Kim. And Helen, my apologies. I see you are here today representing uh, uh, Director Gillarducci. It is great to see you, Helen, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Yes, Director Gillarducci sends his regrets. 
but he's a very busy man lately with all the disasters that our state is facing. I am pleased to report that he met with Governor Marina del Pilar Avila, uh, Baja California and her delegation in uh, September. We discussed um, the collaboration and the long-standing relationship that we have with her Department of State Civil Protection. We look forward to meeting her director soon and welcome, welcoming him to Cal OES. In regards to PPE donations, um, we've been working with San Diego County Imperial and the San Diego Mexican Consulate on providing PPE donations um, to those to, to combat COVID in those highly impacted areas. Uh, this year alone, we provided approximately 4 million in PPE, including masks, gowns, and sanitizers to Baja California's NGOs, clinics, um, and other humanitarian organizations. We also established the Unified Border Coordination Group to provide humanitarian assistance to asylum-seeking migrant population along the California-Mexico border region. This was in partnership with San Diego, Imperial County, and Riverside, as well as other state agencies, um, uh, NGOs, um, and federal partners. With, with this partnership and this unified system, we provided COVID testing, uh, vaccinations, medical screening, and collaborated with the NGOs to support and assist the migrants reach their, their final destination. We continue to work with Mex the Mexican consulate on the memorandum of understanding with Mexico's federal agency, the National Coordination for Civil Protection, it's an MOU that we've been working for a while now, but due to COVID, it goes on hold. But this will mainly focus on emergency um, preparedness, management, sharing best practices, training, um, and technical exchange of knowledge and emergency management. Um, we also um, have collaborated with um, various um, consulates, including Mexico, all 10 of them, and uh, the Philippines and El Salvador. Um, in providing and sharing information on COVID-19 guidances, education on how to stop the spread um, of COVID, available resources, as well as provided situational awareness um, with all the fires that we've had um, during this past uh, season. And in collaboration with our NISTOS program, we have provided um, over 19,000 printed copies of the Disaster Ready Guide, which includes safety steps for any type of disaster, we provided disaster guide for farm workers, which illustrates tips on COVID-19 and disaster preparedness for the agricultural community. We have also shared COVID-19 and disaster preparedness audio messaging in various indigenous languages, such as Mesteco, Zapoteco, and Triqui, among others. Um, and in partnership with other state agencies and the leadership of the governor's office, we held a farm worker while fire preparedness listening sessions to over 100 community-based organizations on emergency preparedness for the agricultural community. Um, this was a great opportunity to also listen and get feedback and recommendations from the CBOs. Um, we continue to participate, participate on the binational COVID-19 conference call uh, that takes place uh, twice a month um, with representatives from local, state, um, and uh, state agency and other um, state agencies on exchanging mutual information on COVID and status updates. This is between California and Baja California. And um, we also participated and made a presentation to, it's called Group of Latin America's Consulates. It's comprised of uh, various consulate members from South America and Latin America. They wanted a presentation on Cal OES overview, our roles and responsibilities, and what should they do during a disaster? So we had that, that was a great conversation there. And we also participated on an emergency management roundtable discussion with FEMA, State Department, Office of Foreign Mission, um, that was led by the Portugal consulate who invited the European consulates to have that discussion on emergency preparedness and, and uh, response during the disaster, who should be their point of contact when, this is, when a disaster is happening. And then our Deputy Director of Planning and Preparedness participated in a webinar hosted by the Consulate of Japan to commemorate the 10th anniversary of uh, the Great East Japan Earthquake and discuss uh, earthquake prevention and mitigation efforts. And we also held uh, a virtual call with Germany, their Ministry of the Interior on cybersecurity 
This was done under, under the umbrella of the California Germany MOU that was signed in 2018. We brought a representative from the Department of Technology and from our cybersecurity, and they want to start the conversation on cybersecurity efforts. And lastly, we met with um, representatives from Catalonia, Spain. They actually had the opportunity to come and visit with us. We gave them a tour of the State Operations Center. And with them, they also want to collaborate on emergency preparedness. Um, they discussed the possibility of, of, of developing a working group on emergency management and response and preparedness. And that's all I have. Thank you. Well, thank you, Helen. Oh, thank, you. Uh, thank you for that great overview. I know that OES is working every day on issues of uh, everything from transnational crime to emergency cooperation and, co cooperation and preparedness. So thank you for the great overview for the committee and of course also for the public so that people have a better sense of the important work that OES is doing every day. Next, we'll turn uh, to Carolyn Vitetta of Visit California. Nice to see you, Carolyn. The floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Lieutenant Governor. It's great to see you and everyone here. And um, certainly we've had a little bit of forward momentum since our last meeting. Uh, as you know, international travelers are have always been our very highest value uh, consumers. And prior to the pandemic, uh, 2019 numbers, they spent $28 billion in our state. Our urban cores are, uh, that being San Francisco, Los Angeles, and San Diego, fully 77% of our international visitor spending uh, took place in those urban cores. Those are our biggest economies. They're some of the largest travel economies in the United States. And it's really because of this lag in international spending that we are still looking out at 2024 before we're seeing full COVID recovery, that and the business convention group sector. But international visitor spending is key to our recovery. So beginning on November 8th, after 20 long months, uh, thanks to the Biden administration, the USA reopened its air borders to fully vaccinated travelers from 33 countries. The land borders with Canada and Mexico also reopened in November to vaccinated travelers. So this border reopening, including many of California's key international markets, including the UK, Germany, France, Italy, Japan, South Korea, India, and many others. Our data uh, from Forward Keys uh, looks to some very positive trends. This data tracks with air tickets purchased to California. It showed an immediate increase in bookings uh, once the announcement was made and through today. Bookings in the UK, according to British Airways, for example, increased 700% and in, air, in France, 400%. So pent up demand is there. These are actual bookings, not just people seeking information about California. It's even encouraging that even after the news of Omicron, our neighboring countries of Canada and Mexico have, been not, have not been reporting a decrease in booking demand. And this really just showcases the strength of our North American markets. In terms of our global market priorities, certainly we'll continue to double down on our domestic promotional uh, program of work while we wait for full recovery on the international sectors. Uh, but we are re-entering key international markets that demonstrate the greatest opportunity for immediate travel recovery. Uh, to, and, and really looking at shortening the time frame for recovery and restoring that leisure spend. We're really looking at this calibration through our international recovery priority markets tool, which tracks on a weekly basis, public health, the state of public health, the consumer sentiment and willingness to travel and economic output. So with that, our top prospects, no surprise, are Canada and Mexico. Uh, we've actually spent the last eight years investing in millions in direct-to-consumer advertising there. So we have now programmed for this year, frankly, uh, about $1.6 million to spend in Canada uh, in partnership with Air Canada. 
and for Mexico about $1.2 million and a partnership with Volaris. Our next priority markets are the European markets, principally the United, uh, United Kingdom, France, and to a lesser degree, Germany. Uh, interesting to note between the United Kingdom and France, Europeans have about $7 billion in paid credits, travel credits. And so we are looking to tap that interest immediately and be uh, a different a differentiator to market. Principally, we're working on a partnership now with British Airways, American Airlines, our gateway cities, to, and Brand USA to invest about $8 million dedicated to the UK because the majority of these uh, flight credits are in the UK and they show the highest propensity to travel to the US, as I've said. So that's where our priorities are today. In addition to that, we're continuing our trade activation, our own channels, digital, PR, and research across our other uh, global market priorities. Uh, no surprise, as you mentioned in your opening comments, our Pacific uh, Asian markets are the slowest to really open, and so we're really waiting. Places like Australia are interesting. It's a mixed bag. While Sydney is fully open and can travel without quarantine, uh, other parts of Australia are in a different situation. So it's much like the U.S. or even uh, until yesterday, California, where we had differing requirements. And of course, they're always changing. But nonetheless, uh, we see you know, continued opening up with increased vaccination rates on the horizon. And we are calibrating and starting to plan investment on those timely basis. I just wanna close because you're gonna comment on the recent COP26 event and forum and my participation as a member of the executive committee uh, with the World Travel and Tourism Council. They were very active there. I sit on that sustainable committee and I'm also the chair of US Secretary of Commerce, Chair uh, Secretary Raimondo, her sustainability committee as part of the Travel and Tourism Advisory Board. So I really applaud your work and your time and all of you that were at the table uh, there in Glasgow, it's very important to us that we have uh, equality and really consistency in sustainable travel, responsible travel on a global basis. So if there was anything that COVID brought to us as a silver lining, I really feel strongly that we're looking at leaning into sustainable travel, which really helps to renew and improve communities uh, as well as wildlife around the world. So it's a very important priority as we are coming out of COVID that we can do better and have a reset button, if you will, because of COVID. So thank you for your time today. Love hearing everybody's report. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Patetic. Can I ask you, um, you mentioned that uh, pre-pandemic international spending in California was about $28 billion. Um, how many visitors did that correspond to? And what are the numbers that we know of for last year and or this year? Yeah, um, in, in terms of percentage, it's quite small. It's 6% of total visitation, but it's actually 18% of our travel spending. So when you look at it in terms of visitation, about 80% of our travelers are Californians moving, you know, up and down the state. And then you've got about another 12 to 13% that are out of state domestic travelers. And then finally that 6%. But again, they really, the international travelers, they stay longer, they spend more, and they really make the difference for our uh, visitor communities because they travel off peak shoulder seasons and midweek when really the businesses need it the most. But, so what was the estimated number of international travelers, travelers pre-pandemic? Yeah, um, so it, let's just take Mexico, for example. Um, Mexico pre-pandemic, there's about 400,000 air travelers. 
Um, but there's, you know, closer to 7 million border crossers. So, you know, we're not really sure. It's, it's hard to estimate. Canadians, um, 800,000 to a million uh, Canadians, and then the rest were, uh, is everyone else, it, just to give you an idea. And I can, I can follow up with you with that total number, but it, uh, just from memory, because of the, sure. the ground crossings in the air. Yeah, um, and it's complicated to get yeah. raw numbers that actually can kind of make sense. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And thank you for leading in to the rest of the reports. Uh, again, with um, several uh, of those uh, who are going to present next who were in Glasgow, uh, starting with um, a secretary, uh, sorry, chair of the California Energy Commission, David Hochschild. Chair Hochschild, the floor you. is yours. Thank you, Madam Lieutenant Governor, and great to see you uh, earlier uh, in the week at the dinner at uh, the Japanese consulate. Looking forward to that to that trip as well. So uh, I think you all know the, some of the top issues we're working on at the Energy Commission, building decarbonization uh, in Lithium Valley, and building out the transportation electrification infrastructure and offshore wind. For me, this trip was really principally about offshore wind. I visited three different offshore wind factories and three different offshore wind projects. Uh, just by happenstance, it turns out that the largest floating offshore wind project in the world is in Scotland in Aberdeen, uh, not far from where we were at the COPS. So I did a visit out there. <clears throat> this project is about 10 miles off the coast. Actually, it's right in front of Donald Trump's golf course as it, as it happens. And it is a floating platform. Um, and essentially this is the technology that we're gonna be deploying here in California, where it's tethered to the seabed with three high tension cables. The size of the turbines is growing rapidly. So when we started working on offshore wind at the Energy Commission about five years ago, the largest turbine in the world was seven megawatts. Uh, they're now at 14 megawatt turbines. Um, and so the blades uh, for the new ones they're building are 105 meters. So the blade is longer than a football field one rotation of the turbine powers a house for a day. Uh, so that's the scale that they're at. And I went over there with great curiosity and great humility because we are way, way behind Europe on this. We don't have a single offshore wind project in the Western coast of the United States um, and very little uh, so far on the East Coast, but more, more is coming. Uh, the UK on the other hand has 10 gigawatts installed. So their whole electric load for all the UK is 60 gigs and they are building 40 gigs altogether of offshore wind. So they're gonna get the majority of their electricity from this technology. Most of the projects are uh, you know, in the range of five to 10 miles offshore. Some of them as far as 60 miles offshore. Generally, it's been very, very well received. There's not been much opposition. The only issue they had in the North Sea um, and this is instructive for us as well, is there are some birds that go 10 miles offshore during mackerel season, but they fly very low to the water. So what they do is they just raise the turbine size up and they have a 22 meter air gap from sea level to the bottom of where the, the, the tip would, would go. Um, and other than that, they're just not having issues. It's working incredibly well. Uh, and it was super exciting to see how ambitious they're being. And I learned a lot from them about port upgrades and, and the other uh, support they need to do to make that a success. But generally it's been very popular and, and this is why we're so pleased with the agreement um, that we struck uh, with the governor and, uh, and uh, the Biden administration in the spring uh, where we'll have approximately 375 square miles off the central coast uh, that's gonna go to lease sale in September uh, and we'll get offshore wind moving in, in California. So that was really inspiring. Had a couple other highlights while I was there, we went to visit uh, Blue Planet had a, had a uh, showcase. Uh, this is, uh, they're making basically uh, concrete with, they pump CO2 into it. So it becomes a sort of bank for uh, CO2 um, and some great meetings as well with, with uh, various delegations from Israel and Germany and so forth. Um, we did on the home front have a, oh, and a very good meeting with uh, Secretary Granholm, who by the way, um, had a, another visit with her yesterday. They have 62, billion dollars in new money from the infrastructure package that has tripled their DOE budget and they're going to be doing all kinds of technology hubs 
that we're engaging with them to, to get them to, to do that in California, including you know, battery hub and carbon capture hub and hydrogen hub and, and uh, some others. Uh, and so uh, really, I just wanna say the representation from the Biden administration at the COP was outstanding. Uh, cabinet secretaries, the president himself. Uh, and it really felt in many ways like the most compelling COP since Paris. Um, you know, it's, you know, I think the best summary of the event to me was, you know, better than expected, uh, not as much as hoped for, but that's uh, still still progress. Uh, and I think uh, just to see that turnout from the Biden administration was, was itself very powerful. Um, so just a couple of the little highlights on the international side from, from our end, we do an annual symposium with the Germans, which we just completed the California Germany Bilateral Energy Conference. I wanna thank Alana Sanchez uh, and the rest of the Energy Commission staff that worked on that. It's always been a really fruitful uh, dialogue with those guys. Um, and then uh, we joined Luanne Randolph and some others and I uh, joined the, the meetings with the governors of Nuevo Leon in Baja recently and wonderful to see how aligned they are with us on, on climate and renewables uh, and a great, um, a great opportunity for partnership uh, with, with Mexico. Uh, and I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much for that report. And uh, I, I love hearing um, your optimism around the development of offshore wind off the state of California. Um, uh, I think that that is very, very exciting for the uh, ability of California to meet our, our 2045 goals. Um, it's just tremendous. Uh, we're going to turn now uh, to Secretary Karen Ross um, from CDFA. Uh, Secretary Ross, good to see you. The floor is yours. And, and if I might, um, Secretary or Director Myers talked a little bit about the port congestion and supply chain issues. Maybe you can touch on that a little bit for us, uh, tearing off of, of her uh, remarks about some of those challenge and how it relates to agriculture and maybe the drought as well. So Secretary Ross, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Um, so I'll reorder how I was gonna do my comments and just start with the supply chain disruption that has just been a compounding stress point for all of agriculture. Actually, agriculture is already feeling disruptions in trade because of the tariff issues that happened in the previous administration. So just coming out of that and then going to the COVID pivot, um, trying to keep our farm workers safe and healthy and not knowing where the markets were going to be. And then to have this on top of that has made us a very challenging year for agriculture. And then we added drought on top of all of it. The good news is this is a good week for moisture. So let's hope we put a lot of it into our reservoirs. Um, trade, I just want to remind everyone how critically important international trade is for our agricultural sector. We're the largest producing state and a large number of our products are destined for export markets because we specialize in those high value specialty crops, our, our dried fruits, our tree nuts, our, our wine. I have to mention wine and our dairy products are just some of the leading exports that we do. $23 billion on an annual basis, 21 to $23 billion. Um, that, that generates an additional almost $25 billion in activity as it goes through that value chain and almost 165,000 jobs that are created because of what we do in the export space. So critically important, I am so grateful to the governor with executive order and establishing the, the supply chain task force. Um, really appreciate the leadership of Dee Dee Myers at CoBiz and Secretary Kim at the transportation agency of bringing all the parties together the session that we did this morning was extremely helpful, bringing all the parties together because it's not one piece of the supply chain, it works as a system. And I think um, Director Myers really touched on that. So I'm hopeful that by bringing parties together, we will identify some short-term as well as those long-term solutions to prevent this kind of disruption in our future. But we just have a lot of work to get through this one. Um, I do want to... Um, comment on the great work of our staff, as well as GoBiz, of finding those ways to host many, many, many virtual meetings and buying opportunities. Our staff, our staff of one, Josh Eddy, who's terrific at this, um, so far this year with our United States Department of, of Western Trade Association has hosted 40 global trade events that have all been virtual. Um, the early numbers of uh, the return on that has been about $23 million in new sales. 
and 119 participating companies. Um, the state itself has hosted four different events or virtual buying events to introduce people to our fabulous products, how Josh gets them all shipped there so they can do the tasting with them, I don't know. But we've done um, Central and South America since September, Israel since September, South Africa since September, and the EU. And just this week, we are hosting a series of events for Southeast Asia. Um, Josh also put together an impressive delegation to do an in-person trade show in Guadalajara, Mexico in October. And we will be hosting a number of buyers at the Fancy Food Show in Las Vegas later this month. So it's been a very busy year and we can only hope that we're planting the seeds for future returns on doing all of that. We've also have continued our collaboration on international webinars around climate smart agriculture because of the huge interest in that. We did one with Portugal earlier this month. Um, I also spoke at an international webinar that was hosted by the French government on soil health the week after I got back from the COP. Um, and we really uh, were thrilled last week with GoBiz to host um, representatives from the Dutch embassy in, in DC um, around um, all the work that we can do together. I am especially pleased about that one because my very first climate smart delegation visit was to the Netherlands. This is a follow up on our MOU and partnership and we have a similar one with Israel and the Western Cape of South Africa. So a lot of good work going on in that space. I wanna close very quickly with my experiences at COP26. I was part of the second week delegation and was thrilled to be there. I actually participated in two panel discussions on methane emission reductions, which was so timely because just the week before that, there had been over hundred countries that signed a pledge to reduce methane emissions as a short-lived climate pollutant. That's one of the fastest ways for us to meet our climate goals. And so I spoke on two different panels, including my last presentation was with our Air Board Chair uh, Randolph on what we're doing in the livestock sector. And it's pretty, pretty impressive in that regard. Was also a participant in water, climate and a resiliency panel in the water pavilion. Um, I participated in a healthy soils event hosted by the French that was really launched um, at the Paris Accord. And there are over 110 countries and subnationals that participated in that. So it was fun to do that kind of an event. And then I was also a participant in a nature and biodiversity event um, on the last day. Um, really had good visits with my counterparts, the Minister for Agriculture for Ireland, the Secretary, the Cabinet Secretary for Agriculture and Rural Development in Scotland, and closed my sessions in London with a half day with Foreign Ag Service at the US Embassy, which is Fabulous if you haven't had a chance to visit it yet. Um, and my last meeting was with Lord Goldsmith, who's the Minister for the Pacific and the International Environment. His passion was really making sure that nature and biodiversity became part of what the COP focused on. And so it's great to be there to really stress the role of farmers and ranchers as part of the solution. And with that, I'll close. Thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary Ross. And we will. Uh, let's see. Yes, uh, Secretary Blumenfeld, um, we will pass the floor to you. It was great. You and I overlapped uh, during our time. Of course, COP26 is two weeks long, so there was a little bit of a difference, but uh, you were there from the very beginning. Uh, so the floor is yours, and we look forward to hearing your thoughts about COP26 and other things that Cal EPA is doing. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Um, yeah, it was great to be there with you, and thank you for your leadership and commitment and fast action and um yeah we we just to give folks a flavor um lieutenant governor and a whole group of californians had a, a really the first day of cop um had a breakfast with california innovators about 60 californians came so california talking about how well the federal government is represented but i feel like california civil society academics uh, ngos uh, a lot of businesses um, and government. And as you heard from uh, Karen and David and uh, the chair, um, and we'll hear in a minute from um, Leanne, huge amount of, of activity that happened. I would just cast it just kind of big picture, I think, for COP. You know, a lot of people um, were looking at international action just for people listening. You know, we, we aren't a sovereign nation. Um, 
actually, it was great to have a sovereign nation and uh, the Europe tribe came um, really great to have them represented and actually a lot of youth activists. But in terms of sovereign nations, um, the US represents California. Um, and yet to everyone's comments, we had a great deal of bilateral engagement um, with China, Canada, you know, a whole panoply of different states wanted to meet with California to understand what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, I would say the number one thing for me was uh, increase in ambition. There really wasn't anyone who was denying the importance of climate change. Every country, even those oil producing countries, I think realized finally they had to join the negotiations. Um, even India um, finally joined in coming with a net zero commitment. It was in the long time in the, in the future, 2070, but I think it signaled that the world realizes we need to get to net zero carbon, um, which is a big deal. You heard from um, Karen, the discussion about methane. Uh, California has really been a leader, both with her in ag, but also um, in recycling um, and issues um, in the oil and gas sector. And there's obviously lots happening on that in terms of remote sensing and California next year under the governor's leadership will actually launch a satellite to look at methane. So. Um, huge amount happening there. Um, in terms of uh, other things that happened, you know, the US-China um, agreement to accelerate work on climate, even in the absence of a lot or, or the existence of tension between those two nations, um, I think climate was elevated to an issue that needs uh, attention irrespective of, of what other political things are happening. So. We came back, um, I think, enthused. Uh, the governor's office asked Cal EPA to undertake an interagency process to identify and refine our 2022 international climate priorities. So we're using the International Climate Action Team um, and most of the folks on this um, panel, on this committee have representation there. So really appreciate Natural Resources and TARP, CEC, GOBIS and others. We actually met yesterday um, and there's a lot of, I think, momentum to look at fine tuning, um, Chair Kunalagas, what we decide makes the most sense to do. Um, we, we've got, uh, as you've heard from, from David, a huge number of MOUs. Are they all as effective as they could be? Like, how do we, how do we make sure those are as effective as possible? Tax credits, um, as Didi and Emily can talk to. Um, and then international coalitions um, at COP26, uh, we co-chair the under two coalition, um, which now has a billion people in the regions in which um, we have participants. Um, so a pretty powerful coalition to really look at how we grow climate ambition at home and abroad. We, as you may know, are just 1% of global emissions, um, but we really have to scale what we uh, what we have learned, and we also have to scale what others have learned and bring it here. Yesterday, um, Sam Asifa was pointing out that we do a pretty terrible job on vehicle miles traveled. How do we learn from other countries and bring that expertise to us for the specific things that we need? So it's definitely a two-way um, street. In addition, I think one of the things that people were most interested in at COP was how much we are under the gun when it comes to climate impacts. Um, literally everyone we met with was sympathetic to the plight of communities that are suffering from both the wildfires themselves and smoke, um, drought, the ag impacts, all the things that we're dealing with. Um, thank the Lord we have rain right now, but we're still, um, still deep in a drought. So, I think the, the goal, and we'll share this with others as we move forward, is kind of to refine that agenda um, and um, think about the key relationships that we have, the key issues um, that we want to focus on in the year ahead. Uh, building upon the Lieutenant Governor's comments, we chaired the uh, Mexico Border Relations Council and had uh, Governor um, of Baja California, Marina de Piar, and her whole team literally it was very gratifying to see how many i think we had 10 folks from her cabinet um, from transportation to um environment thinking through issues with us um and that's a really important relationship as we've heard from all the speakers 
We are pleased to announce that Bitter Becker will be joining Callie Pia as the Deputy Secretary for Environmental Justice, Tribal Affairs and Border Relations. Um, she was most recently working for the Navajo Tribal Utility and she was the Director of Natural Resources for the Navajo Nation, uh, where she supervised more than 500 staff um, across the Navajo Nation. Um, so she will be taking the reins uh, January 3rd as it relates to border issues, including the Tijuana River and the New River Improvement Project. Um, we really want to thank all the participants um, that are on, on this council of their work and helping in that. Um, as, as many know, um, the issues around San, San Diego um, and the work of the San Diego, San Diego Water Resources Control Board around trying to prevent um, raw sewage and trash going um, in very large volumes into San Diego County um, is a big priority of this administration and of the chair of this particular committee, um, Eleni Kunalaka. So Eleni, thank you for everything you're doing to push that. Uh, we got $300 million to US EPA um, in the US-Mexico-Canada agreement um, and really pushing forward to make sure that is spent um, effectively. In addition, Senate Bill 170 accelerated and allocated $20 million for cross-border water quality issues. So in closing, uh, we look forward to continuing our work at the border, um, following up on COP26, um, and look forward to hearing from Chair Randolph about her experiences, which I've heard about, but we get to share to the world um, from COP26. Thank you so much. Madam Chair, just with your permission, I just wanted to take a minute to thank Jared for all his coordination of all the agencies together with Lauren Sanchez. It was really helpful. And just, Jared, you reminded me the when you mentioned rain, the funniest no. slogan that I saw from the all the rallies there was uh, some Scottish people holding a sign that said, keep Glasgow cold, wet, and miserable, no climate change. So they have a good, good sense of humor in Scotland. That's great. Um, Thank you. And uh, let me also add my thanks to you, Secretary Blumenfeld, for your leadership and coordination. It really was a very, very impressive uh, uh, group of Californians uh, all together there, uh, showing the subnational leadership of our state, uh, which, as we all know, has tremendous, almost sovereign authority when it comes to our greenhouse gas emissions, which makes California very much a beacon. Uh, and I'm sure that you will all agree, and I can certainly attest uh, that I, I weighed, made my way through the pavilions uh, when you are you know, from California. Uh, people from around the world want to talk to us, want to hear from us, want to know what we're doing uh, and how we're doing it. Uh, and we certainly have a lot to talk about. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it uh, over to you, Chair Randolph. And uh, as Secretary Ross also noted, um, perhaps you might have some very uh, uh, specific things to share when it comes to the piece around methane uh, reduction targets. Uh, but uh, we uh, welcome you and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, I, um, I'm gonna start with uh, some basic kind of updates on air quality work that we're doing internationally. Um, and I'll talk about COP and um, our particular focus there on transportation. Um, but I think your point about uh, people wanted to know what we were doing and more importantly, they wanted to know how we were doing it. You know, they were really interested in how we're implementing um, and how um, we're building on our successes of the past and, and building towards more success in the future. So um, as we do this work on both air quality uh, and climate change, having that how front and center um, is, is uh, Kind of our key focus. So uh, first on air quality, um, we have been engaging with uh, Mexico City on air quality issues. Um, that work um, is following on an MOU signed between California and Mexico City. Um, and uh, Mexico City's air quality team uh, attended CARB's world-class training on quality assurances for air monitoring activities. 
And then um, over the next year, teams across CARB's divisions are expected to engage in a series of conversations about uh, air pollution modeling, um, formation of different gasoline blends, um, as well as programs to respond to air quality emergencies and uh, regulations around volatile organic compounds um, in industrial goods and processes um, and air quality indexing best practices. So we're really looking forward to doing that work going forward. Um, also our air quality planning and science division launched a partnership with the Confederation of Indian Industries, CII in, uh, in India to help the city uh, of Indore establish uh, an air monitoring network and related emissions monitoring evaluation and modeling tools. Um, and so we are meeting regularly with CII with the goal of um, helping support their air quality work for the millions of people in that metro area. Um, over the year, you know, uh, we've had uh, dozens of international meetings and speaking engagements. Um, as others have mentioned, we've participated in meetings with the governors elect of Baja and Nuevo Leon, uh, as well as Mexico's Trade Association for Truck Manufacturers, ANPACT, which is a really important relationship as um, internationally we're making a huge amount of progress in the heavy duty trucking area. Um, so engaging with manufacturers um, internationally uh, is very important. So uh, we also met with New Zealand's Consul General, um, South Korean policymakers and industry, uh, air quality folks uh, in Beijing, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency in Sweden, and uh, various other uh, sort of uh, international conversations. And a lot of those conversations um, tend to focus on uh, transportation. So we continue to do a lot of work in zero emission transportation. We engage uh, regularly with Canada um, across many divisions at CARB, including our executive office, uh, our emission certification and compliance division, our sustainable Transportation and Communities Division, all of those divisions have held regular meetings and continue to build strong working relationships with our counterparts in Environment and Climate Change Canada. Um, and uh, we met recently with the uh, Consul General uh, in Canada from San Francisco um, and talking about some of their goals and ways we can work together. Um, and uh, in terms of carbon pricing, we're also uh, engaging in continued dialogue with um, Quebec, New Zealand, Panama. Um, I met with representatives from Panama in, um, when I was at COP26 about their goal of getting a climate pricing structure in place. Um, Brazil, Sweden, uh, the Yurok tribe, as uh, Secretary Blumenfeld mentioned. Um, so we continue close collaboration and engagement with all of those um, sovereign entities about um, successes and opportunities around climate pricing. Uh, so as we look forward to uh, 2022, um, we continue to uh, discuss engaging on um, with various MOU opportunities. Um, as Secretary Blumenfeld mentioned, you know, uh, sometimes we want to make sure to make these MOUs uh, as actionable as possible, um, and uh, we're always looking for opportunities to um, improve our MOU uh, engagement and detail uh, so that we can make sure ac and accomplish the goals we need to accomplish with these agreements. Okay, so on to COP26. Um, I was there uh, alongside uh, Secretary Ross um, during the latter part of the event, and um, my work mostly focused on transportation. Um, we were there for Transport Day, uh, which was really a, a wonderful opportunity to really see transportation elevated to the main stage um, at COP and, uh, and really pushing that uh, evolution. I was able to attend a number of meetings and announcements around um, transportation. Uh, it's the largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions in California and across the US. So our continued engagement on this issue is um, front and center for our work. 
Um, so we participated in um, an agreement, si a declaration signed um, by over 100 national governments, states, regions, cities, manufacturers, business, investors, um, all committing um, towards a 100% zero emission vehicle sales goal by 2035, um, which is, uh, you know, really something that was spearheaded by the governor's executive order and um, has really gained traction across the world in terms of setting that very clear 2035 goal for light duty vehicles. Um, and then there was also the Global Memorandum of Understanding on Zero Emission Medium and Heavy Duty Vehicles, um, which really brings um, both national and subnational governments together um, to move the needle on 100% zero emission new truck and bus sales by 2040, with an interim goal of 30% zero emission vehicle sales by 2030. Um, and there's such an opportunity for deep, immediate reductions in the medium and heavy duty space. So um, really moving that forward and addressing the impacts that um, our most vulnerable communities are feeling, particularly along freight corridors and near ports. Um, and so that call of action really to prioritize that sector in those communities um, will really push the uh, opportunities forward to um, build a market for um, zero emission transportation and build on the innovation. Um, it was interesting talking to how many folks at COP were saying, you know, 10 years ago, uh, folks were really, um, if, if you had said where we are on heavy duty transportation and the progress we've made in innovating around zero emission, um, trucks, you know, all the way up to class eight trucks. Um, it, we've made remarkable progress and that energy um, at COP around that progress and really operationalizing it, putting those vehicles on the road was, was pal palpable and, uh, and pretty exciting. Um, so it was wonderful to take uh, part in that. Um, also, as was mentioned earlier, California is taking the helm of the Transportation Decarbonization Alliance, um, which is uh, an international uh, cooperative group with governments and, uh, and private industry and advocates. And the focus is really gonna be on infrastructure, the importance of building out infrastructure to support that zero emission uh, transition and more than 30 signatories signed a call to action um, calling for rapid investment in zero emission charging and fueling infrastructure. So that was um, that was a great conversation to be a part of and looking forward to um, implementing that in the years to come. Um, and then I also participated in a conversation at the uh, U.S. Center hosted by the U.S. Department of Energy on how we can strengthen the resilience of the global lithium battery supply chains. Um, and that's a critical conversation in both the energy and transportation space. Uh, and as we think about opportunities in, with, for engaging with our um, trading partners and um, battery manufacturers and uh, dealing with supply chain and opportunities around lithium valley and, and uh, many of the opportunities that we have to really uh, build that market and build the resiliency and strength of the battery market to ensure reliable um, batteries um, to uh, fuel this transition. Um, so that was a really important conversation that I enjoyed having with our federal counterparts. Um, and as Secretary Roth, Ross mentioned, uh, I was fortunate enough to participate with her on a, on a panel um, uh, to discuss methane and the global methane pledge was just such an exciting um, thing to see with so many jurisdictions signing on to real actionable uh, goal setting around reducing methane uh, to meet the climate goals that we need to see internationally. So um, that was a good conversation. Had an opportunity to meet with New Zealand on their transition to zero emission vehicles um, and ways that we can um, support and participate with them um, on the transition that they are undertaking. Um, so all in all, it was a really great experience with a lot of energy and excitement and really good practical conversations. Had the opportunity to sit down with the UK transport minister um, and share with her some of 
um, our implementation strategies around uh, meeting our zero emission uh, executive order goal. So all in all, it was a great experience and I felt incredibly privileged to be part of the California team. So that's my report. Well, thank you very much, Chair Randolph, and thank you for uh, your incredibly effective representation of our state uh, at COP26. There's no question that CARB is really known. Uh, and of course, Mary Nichols was there as well uh, in her kind of iconic capacity. Um, but uh, there's no question that CARB um, has uh, historically really carved out a profile um, in this space and, and your leadership and your representation was very, very uh, powerful and, and, and notable. Um, I'm going to turn it back to you, Ms. Desai, uh, because we now have an opportunity for general public comment. And again, recognizing that this is an important forum for members of the public to, uh, to hear from us and share uh, any thoughts uh, or issues that they would like to raise when it comes to the work of the state of California uh, in international engagement. Uh, Ms. Desai, back to you. Thank you, Madam Chair, Lieutenant Governor. If you would like to make a comment, please indicate so by writing your request in the Q&A field. We will provide you the opportunity to unmute. We request all commenters to please keep their comment to three minutes. When we call your name, a button will display, allowing you to unmute yourself. Comments will be considered in the order they are received. For those who would prefer for us to read their comment on their behalf, you can also simply type your comment in the Q&A field, and you can also select the option to send your comment anonymously. Maria, can you please help us to facilitate the first public comment request? Yes, we have no comments at this time. Okay, well, that is a first for us, um, but certainly uh, allows us to be able to get back to the important work that all uh, of you do. I want to thank all of the secretaries, directors, and their representatives who are on the call today. And um, as I conclude our last meeting of 2021, um, I, I, there's one more thing that I, I would just like to share with all of you in the public, and that is that last week I had the opportunity uh, to be the guest of the uh, Swedish ambassador to the United States in Orange County uh, at a special uh, ceremony and dinner where she presented uh, for the first time outside of Sweden uh, in a formal ceremony uh, the Nobel Prizes. And as I'm sure you all know, Nobel Prizes, when they are uh, awarded, uh, those who receive them travel to Sweden for the ceremony there. Last year, uh, they were essentially delivered to the recipients. And this year for the United States, the eight uh, Nobel Prize awardees in uh, the United States, half of them went to Washington, DC and, and Ambassador Olaf's daughter, uh, delivered or uh, presented the awards there. And the other half were all presented to Californians uh, down in Orange County. And it was a remarkable thing to see uh, uh, researchers and scholars um, from four California uh, institutions, research institutions in our state awarded the Nobel Prize. It was a great honor. Uh, to be there to witness this, witness it. And one of the other things that we talk very often, one of our priorities in our international engagement is for our state to talk about the way that California has benefited from the United States generous immigration policies. And so I just want to note that three of the four California recipients of the Nobel Prize are foreign born and have chosen to make California their home. So I'd like to close today's meeting in honor of uh, those four recipients of the Nobel Prize here in California uh, and wish you all a safe and happy holiday season. Uh, and uh, I look forward to a productive and positive new year uh, in the work that we all do for the people of the great state of California. Thank you all, uh, and uh, I hereby adjourn this meeting.